ओम भद्रम करणे भी श्रृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये माक्ष स्थिरंगुष्वागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शांति 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 so we have been uh, studying the fourth chapter of uh, gaudapada's mandukya karika which is his verse commentary on the mandukya upanishad and of course there is a sanskrit commentary by shankaracharya on gaudapada's um, mandukya karika now the fourth chapter uh, the alata shanti prakarana the, the it's called the quenching of the firebrand the firebrand example is like this if you take a firebrand like a you know we used to call them full jadi or um, sparklers if you swing them around swing the firebrand around you'll get patterns you see patterns in the darkness uh, like patterns of light you can do that if you take a flashlight and swing it around also you can get those patterns in the darkness now just like that uh, what godapada is proposing is that turiya consciousness itself because of that consciousness like those patterns emerges um, the waker and the waking experience the dreamer and the dream experience these experiences are like those patterns and they emerge because of consciousness and really speaking gaurapada is saying they do not emerge there is nothing there that is there except that consciousness itself so uh, that is the example of the firebrand and the quenching of the firebrand alata shanti the quenching of the firebrand is just recognizing that in all our varied experiences of life uh, all these are like those patterns emerging because of swinging the firebrand around similarly all these varied experiences of life are nothing but the consciousness um so all these varied experiences are merged back into the consciousness so to speak so to say this is the quietening or the cessation or the quenching of the firebrand it's not that you actually put the firebrand out you cannot consciousness is ever there and that's what you are realizing that everything in our in your life uh, is like the fire brand the patterns emerging by waving the fire brand across uh, that is what is called quenching the fire brand alata shanti prakaranam who am i i am that consciousness the turiyam this is actually the same thing uh, the central teaching of advaita vedanta that brahman alone is real the world is an appearance and you are none other than brahman in um, mandukya language the turiyam alone is real the world what is the world in mandukya language the waker's world the dreamer's world and even the potential uh, world of the bija the seed form in that deep sleep they are all appearances just like the patterns which emerge when we swing a firebrand around and you the sentient being you who consider yourself to be this waker having a waking experience and you consider this to be the reality what vedanta is telling you that no this is an appearance the reality is you are that background consciousness turiyam what good does that do all good all trouble is in identifying ourselves with the changing mass of patterns body and the world and all peace solution to our problems is realizing here and now that we are that background consciousness which is immortal which is beyond change which is not subject to birth or death it's not subject to old age disease or death it's not subject to elation or depression so you're free of that even in the midst of the patterns all right um what we did last time was verse number um verse number 60 we did that last time najeshu sarvadha dharmeshu shashvata shashvata vidha yatra varna na vartante viveka satra no uchyate so um language does not begin to describe 
either Tuturium or the world appearance. Neither Brahman nor the world appearance can be adequately described by language. That was the meaning. Why can't Brahman or Turiyam be described by language? Seventh mantra we saw. Um, Abhyapadeshyam, not an object of words. That's what he's uh, referring to here as Tatra um, Varnana Vartante. Varna means letters. Words cannot refer to the ultimate reality. But here it specifically means words or, or cannot de adequately describe this creation either. Especially the jivas, us. How do we emerge? Uh, what is the cause? And uh, why is this happening? You know what Gaudapada's answer is, that causality is not real. There is no real emergence of the jivas and there is no cause of them either. Turiyam alone is the reality. And therefore, language cannot adequately describe even this. Uh, specifically, this is the, these statements are the origin of the later doctrine of Anirvachaniyata. Anirvachaniyata means um, language cannot describe this creation as being either absolutely real or, for, or unreal. It's not absolutely real because it comes and goes and knowledge uh, falsifies it. Specific statement, this creation is not absolutely real because it's falsified or falsifiable by knowledge. You realize that it's not a snake. So the snake which you saw, if you can realize it's not a snake, it's a rope. In that case, that snake was not a real snake. Um, yet you cannot dismiss it as unreal, as non-existent, seeing that it makes all this difference. That is Swami Vivekananda's language. You cannot dismiss it as being no, uh, unreal because seeing that it makes all this difference in our lives. Therefore, language cannot describe it as being real or unreal. Um, anirvachanyam. In Sanskrit, sad asad bhyam anirvachanyam. Inability to express it as sat, pure being or asat, completely non-existent. So that's what we had done. Now, today we will go ahead. I know I am rushing a little, but uh, for two reasons, not just for the reason of <laughs> completing it, but also actually you will see and you are seeing how many of these things are repetitions. Um, uh, we have seen on this long journey that what was said in the first, second and third chapters, sometimes verbatim, sometimes the actual verses are repeated. So Gaurapada has one objective here, establishing non-duality and in his own way. What is his way? By attacking causality. And there is no cause, no effect, only Turiyam is there. So that is his approach. And he's, um, what is the use of all of this? We get a deeper understanding of what Advaita means. By exploring it, together with Gaurapada, he takes us into some very fascinating, very deep and profound deliberations on non-duality and causality. And uh, it has its implications for our spiritual life also. So I'll go ahead. Every three or four verses, I'll stop and see what observations, comments or questions are there. Um, Sashank will help me by unmuting you. He'll keep a lookout for your questions and uh, uh, we'll discuss it and then again take up a few more verses. So that's how this ev uh, evening will go. All right, let's see. Verse number 61. Yatha swapne dvaya bhasam chittam chalati mayaya tatha jagrad dvaya bhasam chittam chalati mayaya. As in a dream, the consciousness vibrates as though having dual functions, duality. So in the waking state, consciousness vibrates as though with, as though with duality. So remember the example which I had um, mentioned in the last class, that I was in, I was dreaming actually, but it felt like I was in the plains of Africa and being chased by a lion and I climbed a tree and all that, that whole thing. Now there, Imagine the dream. What was going on there? I felt here I am located in a body and this body is located in a, in a space, this space of the plains of Africa. And there is time and there is space and there is this fearsome object, the lion. 
and there is an event, the lion is running and I am running and there are internal feelings also of uh, fear and anxiety and terror and so on. So all of this was experienced. I and this world, Africa and the lion, subject object. Now look at the verse. It says, Yatha Swapne, as in your dream, O Swami, Dvaya Bhasam. You saw this appearance of duality. What duality? Subject object. I am there, these things are there, and things are going on. Did you not see it? Yes, I saw it. Chittam Chalati Mayaya. But it was all the vibration of one mind, Mayaya. That's why it's saying Dvaya Bhasam. The appearance, Abhasa means appearance. The appearance of duality. Why are you calling it appearance of duality? Because, O oh Swami, did you not realize after waking up, there was neither subject nor object, nor was the Swami there, nor was the lion there, and ne nor, nor the Swami, neither the lion, yeah. subject, object, neither were there. What was there? Chittam, the mind alone, or consciousness in itself. It, it was as if vibrating and dividing itself into two. It was the dreamer's mind. Here he has used Chittam as consciousness, but we can take it as the mind. It is the dreamer's mind which appears as subject and object. And we all agree when we wake up that um, um, there was really no subject, really no object, although you experienced it fully as subject object. Dvaya bhasam, appearance of duality. Okay, we accept that's what happened in the dream. Then so what? Tatha jagrat dvaya bhasam, chittam chalati mayaya. Exactly the same thing is happening here. In the waking world also, you have consciousness, in consciousness appears duality. What is duality? I am the subject, Sarva Priyananda, here. And this is my object. What is the object? This um, computer and the people who are listening there, this room, space, time, it is 745 uh, and so on. All this is the objective world which I inhabit. Both of these are appearing in consciousness. They are appearances because chittam chalati maya, because of maya. But remember, at that time, of course, in Gaudapada's time, the fully developed post Shankara Advaitic whole maya apparatus was not there, but he used it sort of uh, in the sense of magic, illusion, appearance, inexp inexplicability, like that. So, chittam chalati maya, consciousness because of maya, appears as subject and object. Let me read out here for you Swami Vivekananda's poem, which I have referred to again and again. This is from Song of the Sannyasin. There is but one, the free, the knower, self, without a name, without a form or stain. In him is Maya dreaming all this dream. The witness, here, pay attention here, the witness, Sakshi. He appears as nature, soul. He appears as nature, object, the world, the universe, soul, the subject. Know thou art that. That means that consciousness, that witness, the, the knower, the self, the free, the one. Know thou art that sannyasi bold. Say om tat sat om. It's almost uh, just, uh, um, you know, putting Gaudapada in, in this kind of, uh, uh, in, in English verse. It's exactly the same thing which, which Gaurapada is saying here. Already we have got questions, but no. I'll do one more uh, verse because it's exactly the same thing. And then we will take questions. Number 62. Advayam cha dvaya bhasam chittam swapne na samshaya Advayam cha dvaya bhasam tatha jagranna samshaya. There is no doubt that consciousness, though one, appears in dream in dual aspects. So also in the waking state, consciousness, though one, appears to have two aspects or duality, subject object. So exactly the same thing as earlier, but here is saying the consciousness which is one, turiya which is one not two. That appeared in the dream as um, the, the Swami and the lion. 
let's not take Turia. We'll, we'll this discussion will become more deep in, in the next few verses. But let's just say, take uh, for the sake of understanding in the dream. Just understand the dream example on its own terms without bringing in consciousness or uh, Turiya or anything like that. A common sense understanding of the dream which everybody will accept. What is that? Um, in the dream, I, the dreamer, forgetting myself that I am safe on my bed and sleeping, uh, forgetting my, my identity as the dreamer, that's very important. Sleep makes you forget the reality. Once the reality is forgotten, not within our um, radar anywhere, now I, the one mind of the dreamer, appears as two, as duality or multiplicity. I become the subject, the Swami wandering in the plains of Africa or something. I become the object also. Yeah. As the one becomes nature and soul, one consciousness or the one mind becomes like that. Now, this is an accurate phenomenological description of our dream. We all agree here. Now, what the claim is, so this is, there is no doubt, as Gaudapada says, na samshaya, there is no doubt about it. This is how we understand dreams. In the same way, in the waking also, he is not saying that the mind is becoming all this. It's rather, he is saying, Turiya, the consciousness, is appearing as two. As you, the subject, the waker, in Mandukya uh, language, Vishwa. And you are appearing as the universe experienced by the waker, Jagrat Prapancha, the waking universe. The one non-dual consciousness appears as a dual experience. Okay, this is what's claimed here. Let's see. Uh, Shashank? Is Prabhupada? Prabhupada? Yes. Yeah. The first... Uh, the uh, first verse, if I translate, Kittam Chalati Vayak, it sounds like it should be translated as my influence by Maya. Why did Gambirananda introduce the word vibrates? Because that introduces a little more confusion. Wha why did Gambirananda use the word? The vibrates in the translation. Chalati is vibrates. Chalati means moves. It's not, it, it can be translated as, as influenced also, right? Uh, yes, and that's what is the accurate meaning. But the reason is Gaudapada himself uses such language, spanda, vibration. You will see earlier he has used and again he will use. So the, the way to reconcile this is because of Maya it appears to move. Consciousness, Turiya cannot move. However, our under, if you are going to use the dream as an example, you should not bring in Turiya. So there, though Gaudapada has used Chitta in the sense of consciousness, we will see later on, we will make a distinction between mind and consciousness and understand dream on its own terms. Just like everybody understands dream. How do any of us understand dream? Our mind dreams. And the mind definitely chalati, it moves, it vibrates, it changes. Yeah. But you are right. If you are going to talk about thuriyam or consciousness, better not say chalati, vibrates. And also, the question is that, uh, here uh, the translation seems to translate Chittam as consciousness. It is, and that's so correct. It's equating dream and, and waking. Yes, it is. And that's what's Gaudapada's intention. We will in, in, uh, explore this a little later. Notice how I explained it. I did not want to equate Chittam with consciousness. Though Gaudapada is consistently using Chittam as consciousness here, um, in most places. Uh, but in Vedanta, we make a difference. Chittam is mind and Chit is consciousness. Uh, that is, but these are later developments, later clarifications. Gaurapada, therefore, is a little hard to grasp there. But one can see what he is trying to say. Um, to make it easier, we will take we will take it in two steps. Instead of straight away jumping, consciousness alone vibrates as subject object in dream. There is no doubt. Consciousness alone vibrates as subject object in in waking. There is no doubt. That's what Gaurapada says, and he means it. He he means it literally. And ultimately, that's what mu it must be. But we generally don't understand it that way. We have to take it in two steps. First step is, dream means mind is dreaming. We are not bringing consciousness into it. Um, although consciousness must be there. Without consciousness, mind cannot do anything. And then, in the waking state, just like in the dream, 
subject object are produced by the mind similarly the claim is in the waking state this so called real universe is actually appearance in consciousness in chittam but if this is so it is also true in the dream in the dream also the mind of the dreamer and its own internal subject object the whole thing is an appearance in consciousness it must be an appearance in turiya because dreamer and dreamer's world waker and waker's world and deep sleeper and deep sleeper's potential world they are all equally appearances in turiya so this is the conclusion godapada in one sense is terribly difficult to not to understand but to digest but uh, he is very consistent that way and is very simple and straight that way and unshakable yes thank you yes next I think girish wanted to ask something yes girish ji thank you thank yes you. um i i find myself going back to basics all the time and uh and chewing on the old questions again so in that way i i understand the need for the concept of maya and and also karma to explain the waking world as experienced by the jivas maya is the appearance of the objects in brahman karma is the motive force of the world uh, time space causation etc but why do we need the concept of transmigration of souls and reincarnation what does reincarnation contribute to an explanation of experiences we because we don't even experience reincarnation to the most part ourselves and you know asked another way um death for the dream jeevas the dream jeevas in dreamer's dream is is like a light switch the the dreamer wakes up and the and the jeevas are dead essentially they don't reincarnate so why do the jeevas of the waking world uh transmigrate if you want right in spirit in essence you know that godapada agrees with you see he dismisses karma when he dismisses causality he dismisses karma we have gone through this earlier yes uh, there was a whole discussion about karma uh, what is karma then which comes first does karma come first or the body come first that means the birth come first Uh, and then there's a whole multi step step discussion which led to the questioning of the whole concept of karma and overthrowing it but you cannot do it halfway house you if you say i understand the need for karma then you should understand the need for reincarnation also if karma is in some way to be accepted to make sense of this world then uh, all these effects you are presented with because we don't enter the world uh, at the very beginning we enter the movie when the movie is already on we are born when things are already going on presumably for a long time if that's our understanding then we are presented with a whole um a menu of effects for which where are the causes why is one kid uh, born in an affluent country with the parents who give that kid all facilities and you know another kid is born uh, in the midst of famine and danger and death why what karma did that kid perform if a karma is true then karma must extend backwards also b- before this birth and the old question people ask that hitler did so many bad things why did he not suffer and one death is not enough probably true in that case there must be effects later on uh, this person did so so much good but where as where is the reward for that that person just suffered and died so we we don't see a match between causes and effects if that is not if cause and effects an unbroken chain for everything then why not for the jeevas unbroken chain means it goes backwards and uh, extends forwards also in time but yes gaudapada com- uh, questions the whole thing uh, you know you saw that uh, discussion yeah. yeah right thank you yeah i understand yes kunanji uh, yes one th- uh, pu- just before you go uh, yeah. just to remind you we have said this again and again remember we are dealing with gaudapada we are dealing with the uh, with the everest peak the highest peak in the <laughs> himalayas which are pretty high themselves so in advaita vedanta there is nothing higher than this i mean i mean higher than this at the most you can say ashtavakra or something will be there but that's they're not trying to do a philosophy there they're just s- stating a conclusion the conclusion of say gaudapada if you state it 
in 18 chapter over hundreds of verses you will get Ashtavakra. But when you are doing philosophy, Gaudapada is sort of the last word. You will see, uh, maybe today or tomorrow, he will go even further. Do you think he cannot go further? You know, his precious conclusions, non-causality, Ajatavad, the, the doctrine that nothing is originating, that also he will abandon. <laughs> you will see. Uh, I mean, it will just leave you breathless. All right, go ahead. Swamiji, the waking world is also like the dream world according to Gaudapada. Yes. So, from where are we getting the uh, concept of objects? Like if the snow snake is, uh, the rope is appearing as snake, hmm. we must have seen the snake at some point of time. Right. Right. So, from where are we getting so this concept? So, let me answer this specific question. Do you understand? It's a good question because, and it's an ancient question. And it's wonderful that uh, you're coming up with it now. It just shows that your thinking is on track. But it's a really ancient question. Um, Non-dualists have been faced with this question from dualists. You know what the form of the question is? Um, as she said, if you see a, a snake in a rope and the snake is not true, then you must have seen a snake earlier. The dualist asks this question that it's because you saw a real snake somewhere you have a samskara of a snake and that's why you make this mistake seeing a rope in semi-darkness you suddenly see it as a rope if that's your example then oh non-dualist oh advaitin you are in trouble because you are admitting that you must have seen a real world sometime and now you are mistaking brahman for the world so if there is a real world which you saw sometime now why, why go to all this convoluted philosophy why not just say you're seeing the real world now why say that you are mistaking Brahman for the real world? This is the question. The answer is subtle, but it's also <laughs> very interesting. The answer is, to make a mistake, what do you need? You need to have, it is true, you need to have the impression of a snake. Which, and to get the impression of a snake, you must have got it some, sometime earlier. You must have experienced it. You must have experienced it, experienced a snake earlier to, to make a mistake about a snake now. Understood? This is, we, are, we are agreed on this. Now the Advaitin says, notice what you just said. You said you need a ex prior experience of an object like a snake to make a mistake about it now. Right? Yes. Does that prior experience have to be of a real external object or could it be an appearance? I am asking, could it be possible that the child who sees a uh, movie about ghosts can make a mistake about a ghost, you know, get scared about ghosts at night and says, Mummy, there's a ghost in my room. Is it possible? Is it possible that a child who sees Jurassic Park and sees a movie about dinosaurs has never seen a real dinosaur? Can in dream about dinosaurs, can have a nightmare about dinosaurs, can see a dark a moving tree outside the window and think that there's a dinosaur? Is it possible? Yes. Now, it's, it happens all the time. The, the Advaitin says, all you need to make a mistake is the previous experience. And the previous experience need not be of a real thing. It could be of an appearance. You can experience an appearance and then make a mistake about it again. They need not at all be. They, for example, they might not be ghosts. You may hear stories about ghosts and they have never ever may, might never have been a ghost. And yet you make the mistake about ghosts. Children have imaginary friends all the time. Similarly, these are projections in consciousness. Gaudapada would say like firebrand moving. And you get these experiences life after life. And you experience them again. That's the answer. <laughs> so this is, this is due to the projecting power of Maya. Yes. The yes. Uh, because of Maya, consciousness appears as subject object. As... Um, Swami Vivekananda said, one alone exists, the witness, it appears as nature, soul. Witness, Sakshi consciousness, Thuriya, pure consciousness, appears as nature means the entirety of Prakriti, universe, Maya and all its products. And soul means the subject, you. Consciousness with mind operating through senses and the body, both are appearances. Right, I'll just stop there. Shashank? Yes. Abhijit? Pranam Swamiji. Namaskar. Uh, for verse 62, it says that uh, 
the waking state which is non dual why is the waking state non dual um oh therefore in the waking not only in waking state in waking in the dream in deep sleep there is only one reality turiya which is non dual but it appears uh, as dual is referring to the is referencing to the turiya in the waking yes i see so what he says is swapne in dream it is the non dual turiyam which is appearing as the duality okay. just like we don't understand it that way but the way we understand it is my no, mind is appearing as subject object in, in sleep and that's a good example right. the, yeah and here also in the waking the same turiyam which is non dual is appearing as duality good now let's move on 63 um 64 okay 63 and 64 simple enough and this discussion will become pretty deep in 65 and 66 but 63 and 64 are similar all right in fact before i get into it let me just um, explain what's going to happen this is a deeper exploration of the dream and waking examples which we just saw it helps to have this picture in mind consciousness mind and world consciousness mind and world consciousness is turiyam atman purusha sakshi whatever you call it our real nature and that's all, that's the real subject the the ultimately the illuminer of all experiences and that's what we are according to advaita vedanta now introduce the mind thoughts feelings emotions in vedanta the four functions the ego ahankara the intellect buddhi the um the storehouse of impressions the chitta and the mind itself the uh, manas which in which all sense organs dump their information which coordinates everything and so on and so forth all the functions of the our inner being uh, thoughts feelings emotions ideas memories desires uh, uh, intentions all of that mind and the world external world and our bodies too anything physical anything publicly shared between us which we all see so we have three now consciousness mind world consciousness is uh, is the real subject it is never never an object it's impossible for it to be an object the mind is the provisional subject which experiences the world it's an object to consciousness but it is the subject when it comes to knowing the world and the world is always an object let me repeat that very important consciousness is ever the subject it can never be objectified the mind is an object with respect to consciousness it's an object to consciousness and i'm not saying anything strange here because we are aware of our thoughts feelings emotions if you introspect if you are aware of that they're lit up by you the consciousness that's all i mean so the mind is an object with respect to consciousness but with respect to the world the mind is a subject it knows the world so we have three now now let's go into it um these verses we'll be able to understand these better this consciousness mind world he uses this paradigm to understand dream and he again uses this paradigm to understand waking so keep it in mind consciousness mind world verse number 63 swapna drik pracharan swapne दिक्षु वै दशु स्थिता स्वप्न दृक्चिदृश्यास्ते न विद्यंते तत पृथक् तथा तदृश्य मे वेद स्वप्न दृक्चि so what is what has been said here in a dream 
in a dream the dreamer becomes a subject a knower in this world just take my example of my dream in africa so i find myself in this vast plain and uh, there's this lion and i can see my own body so i am the swapna drik i am the knower of this um, the seer of the dream is the subject the person in the dream already in the dream pracharan swapne wandering around in the dream world dikshu in the, in the 10 in the 10 directions dikshu vai dashasu sthitan so wandering in the 10 directions or knowing things in 10 directions what are the 10 directions this is just you know north west east uh, and south and then north east and north west and uh, south east and um, um, uh, south west so eight directions and then up and down so 10 directions knowing things in all 10 directions experiencing things in all 10 directions where in the dream world i am the dreamer so there is consciousness and the dreamer's mind the subjective mind of the uh, person in the dream experiencing all the creatures there um what are those creature creatures andajan swedajan vapi so this is not important but requires little explanation born of eggs and born of moisture so they had a simple classification of beings now we uh, in school we learned an elaborate latin classification of uh, all plants and animals you have to memorize that and write down you know by the phyla and the genera and the species and all of that very detailed and elaborate but um, in those days they had a very simple classification for the purposes of uh, just doing philosophy so all living beings are of they divided into four categories um jarayuja born of womb so mammals um, human beings like like us all mammals born of the womb and then uh, andaja born of eggs so like birds and uh, reptiles and so on and then um, there was the swedaja born of moisture now before you start yelling there's nothing born of moisture it's like uh, insects or lice or um, you know a mosquito for example so we know that they are born of eggs of course but uh, they are usually born in humid or moist places so um, that's why the uh, you will find the city or the municipality tells you to not to have leave stagnant water lying around because it leads to so anyway so their their idea was there are creatures tiny creatures born of moisture and then udbhid udbhid uh, udbhid means that which is born bursting forth from the earth so plants on the which germinate from under the earth and then burst forth you know pierce the earth udbhit literally means piercing the earth so there are four kinds of creatures gorapada mentions only two here andajan means born of eggs and swedajan born of humidity um jivan pashyati yan sada who so in the dream i see all these beings i see um the lion coming ah so the lion is born not of an egg but of the womb of its uh, mother lioness and then there is this uh, tree i saw so it's born it's an udbhid it, it it's born from the earth piercing the earth and so on so all these creatures which we experience in the dream that's the first one it's a description of the dream state now how did i experience these i the subject was the mind of the dreamer and the object was this dream world 65th verse says swapna drik chitta drishyaste na vidyate tatah prithak notice all these creatures the entire dream world did not exist apart from the mind uh, this we realize when we wake up the dreamer's mind my mind alone produced those all those creatures in the dream including me the fellow who was walking around in the Af- plains of africa none of them exist apart from the dreamer's mind point 1 and then he makes this next conclusion tatha drishyam evedam swapna drik chitta mishyate and the dreamer's mind has no existence apart from consciousness it is revealed by consciousness it appears in consciousness and it disappears in consciousness two levels all the um, creatures and everything with places events whatever you saw in the dream all types of creatures born of egg or whatever all the places the plains of africa all the events which happened 
the space and time all of that and the personal body all of that is not separate from the mind which dreamt it absolutely true step two the mind which dreamt it is not separate from the consciousness which illumines that mind it does not exist apart from that consciousness it's like a wave in that consciousness it's no more than a pattern of the firebrand it's no more than a vibration of that consciousness within quotes so this is the description of the dream now you know where this is going he is immediately going to apply it to the waking state 65 66 he is going to apply the same thing to the waking state charan jagarite jagrad dikshu vai dashashu sthitan anda jan sveda jan vapi jivan pashyati an sada jagrat chitte kshani aste na vidyante tatah prithak tatha tatha tad drishyame vedam jagrat chittam ishyate jagratas chittam ishyate all right so it's easy to understand these verses because they are exactly almost sort of um, rhythmic repetition of the earlier verses what did he say charan jagarite dashashu dikshu in the 10 directions in the waking world right now as you are walking around everywhere in your room and outside and wherever uh, maintaining social distancing and all of that all of this which you see and all the beings you come across born of eggs or born of humidity um, or born of the womb all these and the plants in the central park all these beings you come across all the things which are happening in this waking world the space and the time and all of that is nothing apart from the mind which is experiencing it some of you should look skeptical <laughs> now here he is taking a very vigyanavada position the buddhist uh, idealist position he is taking an idealist position here none of this is we can argue this out none of this is anything apart from the mind which is experiencing it the subject which experiences it the mind your mind right now that is uh, and all that you experience now is in you in in that mind itself so that's the 65th verse 66th that mind it does not exist apart from the consciousness in which it is appearing and which is illumining that mind so the consciousness is the reality is the ultimate subject in which appears the mind which becomes a provisional subject which knows the objects which are also appearing in that mind so this objective world is now understood to be nothing other than the mind which is experiencing that objective world right now waking is making this claim you the mind are experiencing the subject which is experiencing the objects the objects are not different from you the subject and you the subject the subjective mind uh, is not different from the real subject consciousness remember that picture consciousness mind world in the what he did in the dream he reduced everything experienced in the dream to the dreaming mind then he reduced the dreaming mind to nothing but the consciousness which was illumining the dream which is that thudium the same consciousness now illumines the waking state in the waking state what happens everything that you experience is nothing apart from the uh, waker's mind your mind and your mind is nothing apart from the uh, consciousness thudium thudium is the only reality which appears as mind then becomes the, which becomes the provisional subject and then appears as its objects and you have subject object experience that's his or the mandukya world view don't worry he'll reject all of it very soon <laughs> all right now let's see if you have any questions right now yes sudeep pranam swami ji yes sudeep ji uh so the question i have is as i do understand that gaurapada is making the parallel between the dream state to the real world yes and to an extent one can also apply that to deep sleep but then looking at the question earlier question which girish ji asked that about punarjanma and all that how do you tie the experiences past death into what category does it go to the deep sleep area does it go to the dream area or how do you reconcile the punarjanma which is after death and then the karma law applies and because you can look at only 
three states, right? Waking, the dream, and deep sleep, and hmm. then thurium is the ultimate. Hmm. So, what about the state which is past the view of death? Is there a new state, or is it already included in thurium? Notice that all states are false, according to Gaudapada. He is not saying that there is thurium and there is waking and there is dream and there is deep sleep. No, he is saying there is only thurium. Correct. Yeah. Now, when you ask about karma and past lives and future lives and all of that, you are ignoring thurium. What you are saying is, this life is real, this waking life. And I have had earlier lives in which I had similar experiences, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And now I am having waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And I have future lives in which I have waking, dreaming, deep sleep. So, this is the common sense uh, uh, idea. Um, our the basic materialist idea is that this is cut off from birth and death. When with the birth of the body, this experience begins. With the death of the body, this experience ends. Religion extends it further. Uh, Vedanta or Buddhism or any of the religions. It says, no, no, not with the beginning of the body, not with the beginning of the end of the body. The mind and the body are not, mind is not born from the body. The mind exists before the body, with the body and then after the body in other bodies. So, there is a continuation. We have come here through many lives and many bodies and bringing with many samskaras and then we are going through these experiences and we will have further experiences in future and if you believe in God and some kind of spirituality you will get maybe liberated from this whole cycle. Gaudapada rejects this whole thing. He is saying that waking, dreaming and deep sleep are not ultimately real. Their appearance is in consciousness. If waking, dreaming and deep sleep are not ultimately real, then what we experience in waking, dreaming, deep sleep, individual going through experiences, possibly past lives, future lives, all of that now becomes under question. Right? So, Gaudapada is not interested. In fact, he will say that um, past life and future life, keep it apart for the time being. Do you even have a present life? <laughs> he will say, it's like asking the Swami that I will save you from the lion, but tell me first, this lion, why do you think it is attacking you? Oh, I am a Vedantist, I know some past life, I must have been a lion and bitten one Swami, now the lion is going to bite me. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so you existed, I must have, because I can see the effect. So, karma must be there and that karma I don't remember, so it must be somewhere before my birth as a Swami. Gaurapada will say, are you really a Swami? Is this really Africa? Is there really a lion? Is this all really happening? Does it require an explanation? No. What does it require? Waking up. Waking up. When you see it from the waking person, Oh, I was in Manhattan in my bedroom. Then all the questions are unimportant. Why the lion attacked me? The answer is there was no lion and there was no me. It looked like that, no doubt. Even after waking up, I cannot deny I saw it was an experience. So, I have to say that it was not ultimately real. Ultimately real is I the waker here. Gaudapada is saying push it further. Here also, right now also, what is it that you are experiencing? External world, mind of Sarva Priyananda, illumined by awareness. Now, this external world of Sarva Priyananda, is it different from the mind of Sarva Priyananda? Gaudapada says no. Here a big step is being taken. In philosophy, they call it subjective idealism. So, this is borrowing from the Buddhists. But then it goes further. Even the mind of Sarva Priyananda, has, is there any proof of that mind without the consciousness? Once you go to consciousness, it is no longer Sarva Priyananda anymore. So, where is Sarva Priyananda? In this mind, in this world. But this mind and this world are both appearances in an impersonal consciousness, which is common to all of us. Or rather, we are all appearances in that impersonal consciousness. That is Gaudapada's very radical claim. And you have to realize it here and now. There I woke up, what is waking up? I moved from one state to another. I moved happily from dream to waking. And that solved my problem. Here Gaudapada says, you cannot move to another state. There are only three states. And moving from state to state will not help you. Uh, all these states are due to ignorance. The reality is the reality underlying these states, which is always available. Turiya is available right now, Turiya was available in dream, Turiya was available in deep sleep. But, but uh, waking state has the peculiar advantage of having Mandukya, 
and Zoom <laughs> and uh, uh, people to talk about it and helping you to come out of this. Yes. So coming out is not going to another state called Turiya. Coming out is realizing that I am the Turiya. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You do realize the questions you are asking are proper questions in any kind of dualistic religious context and there are answers. There are answers. What about past life and how does it work? And they will give you a long answer. Gaudapada says, is any of it, is, is it true? That's what he's asking. Yeah. All right. Bill. Maharaj, uh, a comment and a question. The comment is about what you just said about the dream. The psychoanalyst would look at, the, at your dream and say, oh, this says something about your emotions in your waking life. Yes. But that aside, here's my question. Uh, somewhere Swami Vivekananda says, God, the infinite dreamer, dreaming finite dreams. Yes. Would Gaurapada agree with that formulation? In fact, Gaurapada would agree with what I just read out from Swami Vivekananda. He said, there is but one, the free, the knower self, without a name, without a form or stain. This is a wonderful um, pointing towards the Turiya. In him, him with a capital H, is Maya dreaming all this dream. In him is Maya dreaming all this dream. Exactly this. In Turiya is Maya dreaming all this dream. That's the last explanation that Gaurapada would, would sort of provisionally sign off on. He has the least objection to that exp explanation. Every other explanation he has an objection to. He has an objection to the very concept of explanation. Remember, if you try to explain why the lion was chasing the Swami, you are um, already moving away from the truth, which is that there was no lion and there was no Swami, neither was there Africa. Similarly here, this, uh, we want an explanation of this dream. Gaurapada says, if you want to call it Maya, I have minimal objections. <laughs> what, then what would Gaurapada want us to do? He wants us to give up the whole search for explanations. The very search for explanation makes it real. We are making causality real. When you search for an explanation, you are asking why. Yeah. So he doesn't wonder why there is this whole world experience. It is not there. See, he is very literal. When you say, look at your question, why is there a whole world of experience? Is, for him, is is only to hear. I mean, he says, these experiences are there and they have their own reality whether or not they're bound, you know, He will come to it. To their the own reality? Yes. So there is a kind of own reality to it, which he will talk about later. But uh, the easiest way to understand Gaurapada is, suppose you take only the standpoint of Turiya, the absolute reality. Then what would you say about all of this? That's what Gaurapada says. It may sound crazy to us, and he's going to get crazier now. We'll see now. <laughs> so Maya can have a dream? No. Turiya can have a dream through Maya. Maya itself has, is, has no independent reality. What is happening now is because of Maya we are having this dream. But first we have to realize the dream nature of it all. That's the way out of it. Otherwise we will be trapped in it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, who's next? Alright, nobody. Let's go on. Um, Actually, yes. So I have a question. Uh, is there a question coming so far? I had a big uh, confusion. Was that uh, dream world? What I see in the dream comes is a product of the mind. Yeah. Whereas con in waking world, hmm. it's whatever I see is an appearance on consciousness. But yes. here, in the sixty-sixth uh, verse, yes, Gorupadi is trying to say that it is. There is also my. It's also a product of the mind. Yes. In the world, what I was saying. In, in that the makes it my, my life my very simple. I, I can understand the whole thing now. It makes the, easy, the understanding much more easier. That's what I mean. It's a comment, not a question. So, am I correct to say that the waking world, also what I'm seeing, is a product of my, uh, the mind? Yes, but you might say it makes your world easier, but does it? It makes it more difficult. Our ability to distinguish between dream and waking makes our common sense life possible. 
what Gaurapada is ad advocating is pretty radical. He wants you to treat the waking world like you treat the dream world. No more real. Yeah. yeah uh, but, I, but at least, uh, at least I can understand now what Gaurapada is saying. Yeah. In a logical he is way. logical. He is he's, he's very logical. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he is very logical. But if you treat your job and your wife, husband, children as figments of dream, you see what they do to you then. The rea reaction will be <laughs> pre pretty harsh. It will convince you that they are real. <laughs> so, yes. But Gaurapada is logical. He says the same thing could have happened. Even in the, in the it will come next. How he gives a provisional reality to this waking world. What Bill was saying. Um, he would have said, see, even you, we all agree that uh, Africa experience was a dream. But in that dream, if when you are running from the lion, if somebody tells you it's a dream, don't run from the lion. Treat it as a dream. It's quite possible that the lion would have jumped on you and you would have had the terrible experience of being torn apart by a lion. Godopada would have said that it, that is also a dream. Now, if you are willing to do that in the waking state, it happened. Swami Turiyanandaji, he is with Gurudas Maharaj, who is an American monk. They are traveling towards, um, I think they are in Uttarakhand and in, they are on a pilgrimage. And at night, they are staying in a place with other pilgrims. They have lit a fire, it's cold. There are monks and devotees, householders, all of them are pilgrims. Now, they are discussing Vedanta. And Turyananji, of course, was a fiery Vedantin. So, he's talking about the unreality of the world. And then one gentleman said, No, no, you cannot equate this life with, this waking life with dream. And Turyananji insisted, it's like a dream, nothing more. It's an appearance. And then the gentleman said, can you thrust your hand into the fire? And Turyanandi got excited. He stood up and said, yes, I can do it. The hand will get burnt. Huh. But I know it's neither the fire nor the hand. This body is real. I know I can do that. And he was about to do it, jump into the fire. When a group of people caught hold of him and pulled him back. See, he's very logical that way. Just because you think it's a dream, will not, even in a dream, a dream lion can eat up a dream swami. <laughs> a dream fire can burn a dream swami's dream hand also. But it, and the pain also will be there. But yes, um, you can see that they are all appearances. That's what Gaudapada is saying. But that's, understanding that is the only way to get out of the suffering. Yep, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely true. Let me just uh, go ahead with the next few verses. So that was 65 and 66. Now, if you see what's going on underneath, it's very interesting. 64, 63, 64, 65, 66, Gaurapada has taken up the Vijnanavada Buddhist argument that the world is a projection of the mind. Remember, not just consciousness, of the mind itself. Subjective idealist. Just like the dream, it seemed to happen outside, but it was all in your mind. Waking world is also, it seems to be outside the world, but it's actually all in your mind. That's what, who says, not Vedantin, the um, subjective idealist Buddhist, Vijnanavada Buddhist. And someone like Berkeley, the um, uh, Bishop Berkeley, the uh, philosopher, subjective idealism. And Gaudapada has used it. You see, as he says, just as a dream world is not different from the dreamer's mind. Similarly, waking world is not different from the waker's mind. But just as the dream world, dream mind is also an object to dream conscious, to the consciousness, and not apart from it. Similarly, waker's mind is also an object to you, the consciousness, not apart from you. That was Gaudapada's argument. Now, if you see the next verse, you will see he is using the argument of another kind of Buddhist, the Shunyavadi. It is a very Nagarjunian argument which he will go into now. What he will say, let me just say that. It's a very sophisticated point he is going to make. He says... You know something, mind and its object, and they depend on each other. Have you noticed something? The way we were talking now, it's as if the mind is projecting its objects. Yeah. Lion and Africa and all projected by the mind. As if we are giving the, giving the uh, impression the mind is real and the objects are unreal. Like the mind is the projector and the objects are unreal. Uh, its mind is like the dreamer and so there is some reality to the mind. As if the mind can exist without projecting the objects. But he says, is it true? Isn't it rather 
that the knower and the known they arise together and fall together think about it whenever there is some knowing then only the when the object is known the knower is also known you have the experience of subject and object together or not at all the way you are arguing till now is as if you are trying to prove the subject is real and the object is unreal as if the object is a dream of the subject that's what you are trying to do when you are trying to say um, maya or god is dreaming this universe you are subtly in indicating or not so subtly that the dreamer god maya is something real and the rest is the dream of that maya god subject or whatever but is that true now he will ask isn't it more true that both of them come up together and disappear think about it many people have, have come across this or stumbled across it but it's actually nagarjuna's uh, insight when there are no thoughts when there are no perceptions feelings imaginations thoughts uh, is there a mind at all when are you aware of the mind when the mind knows something when the mind thinks something when are you aware of the eyes when there is something to see when are you aware of the ears when there is something to hear knower and known subject and object rise and fall together they depend on each other both are false this is nagarjuna's argument not only is the world false that is the vigyanavadi but the knowing consciousness is also false why because they both rise and fall together there is no evidence of the mind existing without the known object i had an experience once in a very dark room in the himalayas it was so dark no light at all that i could not see anything even with my eyes open and i remember opening and closing my eyes rapidly and seeing it made no difference i could have been blind i would not have known the difference where is the evidence that your eyes are open if there is nothing to see where is the evidence of sense organs if there are no sense objects where is the evidence of a knowing mind if there are no knowing knowable objects deep sleep deep sleep is suppose you consider deep sleep nothing is experienced we say the sleeping mind mind has dissolved into its deep deep sleep state it's all language nagarjuna will say you're just playing with words where is the proof of the existence of the mind when the objects of waking or dreaming are not there so knower and known rise together fall together it is both they are uh, mutually supporting illusions they have no existence of their own don't try to make out as if the knower is real and the known is just an appearance both are equally false this is what he will say now 67 ubhe hyanyonya drishyete kim tadasti ti nochate lakshana shunyam ubhayam lakshana shunyam ubhayam tanmate naiva grihyate so they the mind and the the object subject and object are both perceptible to each other no or unknown If the question arises does it exist the answer is given no both of them lack valid proof and each is perceived merely because of a preposition with the other with the, because of an dependence on the other because of an ob, a mutual obsession which is a very interesting um, uh, position to take and underlying as i told you if you have a background in buddhism you see how gaudapada has shifted from using vigyanavada buddhist logic uh, subjective idealist mind is projecting its objects uh, and then consciousness projecting the mind to subject object both rise and fall together the example used by nagarjuna by chandrakirti who is a commentator on nagarjuna this is the, uh, hundreds of years before gaudapada they don't use snake and rope example you see the interesting thing about snake and rope example is we it proves snake is an appearance though we see it it's not real and there is a reality which we do not see called rope similarly we will say there is this world it's an appearance and we do not uh, it's not real but there is a reality which we do not see which is our reality which is turiya brahma put atma something 
So snake rope example immediately points to an underlying reality. But the example Chandrakirti is, is uh, fond of is bales of hay, hay which is tied together and they are kept in the field you will see after cutting they are kept like this, stacks against each other like this, mutually interlocking and supporting bales of hay. They are not depending on something else, they are depending on each other. There is no further reality to them, mutually interdependent they arise. So, you suppose you take them away subject object, are you saying there is nothing? That also um, Nagarjuna will not say. He said, I do not say there is nothing. So, I'll, because he says that then people will make nothing into an ultimate reality. Nagarjuna, uh, Chandrakirti uses another example of a child who was told by his mother, here is a, uh, some paisa, go to the shop and buy the groceries and don't come back empty handed. So, he goes and he asks for these things and the shopkeeper says, but it is all gone, it's, uh, I do not have anything, I have nothing. And then the child said, all right, give me some of that. I, have, I cannot go back empty handed. So, you said you have nothing, so give me some of that. Uh, so, nothing is also not a thing. Uh, you, ca you cannot say that there is nothing. If that sounds very confusing, then you are not uh, alone. <laughs> so, Gaurapada here. Now, will you say that he is uh, denying Turiya itself? No, no, no. What he is denying is, earlier he had said there is a world, there is a mind and there is consciousness. Then he defined, he, he said that the world is an appearance because it is all in the mind. Now he is saying the mind is also not really real. Both mind and world appear and disappear together. And you know his uh, project is to point towards the underlying Turiya. Turiya does not apply, uh, appear or disappear together. You see why? Why? Turiya is that which reveals the subject and object interacting. And when subject and object are not interacting, deep sleep, samadhi, that is also you are speaking about it. People have experienced it. How? So, there must be something there. Uh, that is the Turiya. So, that is what he is saying. I mean, he has not said it explicitly, but he means that. He is not denying Turiya, but he is denying the ultimate reality of mind. Ultimate reality of external world dismissed by Vijnanavadi Buddhist and the reality of the knowing mind now dismissed by the Shunyavadi Buddhist and he is leaving the ground clear for Advaita. I am reading all this into it, but of course he does not say it like that. Then let us do three more verses, um, 68, 69, 70, this is simple and easy verses. So, what about us? What about these? Let us forget the great Turiya, but Jiva, back to sentient beings like us. What are we then? We means the apparent person. The reality we are Turiya, no doubt. 68, 69, 70. Yatha Swapna Mayo Jivo Jayate Mriyate Picha Tatha Jiva Ami Sarve Bhavanti na bhavanti cha. As a creature seen in a dream undergoes birth and death, so also do all these creatures appear and disappear. Yatha maya mayo jivo jayate mriyate picha tatha jiva ami sarve bhavanti na bhavanti cha. As a creature conjured up by magic undergoes birth and death, so also all the, do all these creatures appear and disappear. Yatha nirmita ko jivo jayate mriyate piva tatha jiva ami sarve bhavanti na bhavanti cha. As a creature produced through medicines and charms undergoes birth and death, so also do all these creatures appear and disappear. Um, artificial creature. So, I was reading in, in Jewish uh, mythology, there is this idea of a golem. So, it is a mass usually of clay or mud, which is animated. You put the name of God, write it down and uh, put it in the mouth of that golem. It is a vaguely human shape. It becomes animated and the one who controls it, it will do all tasks for you. And once you take it out, it will again become a lump of clay. Was it really born? Did it really die? No. It appeared to be an animate creature. Um, 
So I guess one day if we have, or we are almost there, robots, for example, and you can plug, pull the plug on them. Similarly, he says artificial creatures, uh, artificial creatures, nirmitako jiva. So he has given three examples. As all the creatures in your dream, they appear to have personal histories. The Swami in that Africa and the lion also was chasing the Swami and the tree which the Swami and the lion both climbed. All of them seem to be really there and you, you might trace out their histories. Uh, who were they? Where did they come from? Who were their parents? Uh, what is their lineage? All of that you can trace out. But no, it's inexplicable. Actually, they have no birth, no death. They appeared in the dream. Similarly, he says, Ami Sarve Jiva, every living being who has ever lived or will live or is living on this planet are appearances like that. He says, Bhavanti na Bhavanti cha. They appear to exist and then they don't appear to exist. They appear not to exist. It's not actually a real story of birth, living, dying, no. Then he goes, and he, another example, Maya Mayo Jiva, like a magician. Uh, who produces apparently living creatures, uh, you know, a dove out of a pigeon out of a hat or something like that. Though those are actually <laughs> real pigeons, but there's a sleight of hand there. But imagine illusory creatures produced by magic. They really don't have a birth. They really don't have an end. They are all appearances or illusions. Similarly, all creatures here. Just like artificial creatures, like a golem, uh, so also all creatures here. Then what is real? Are we not real? Yes, you are real, but as Duryam. Swami Vivekananda put it there, put it here. Somebody asked, but what about us individually as persons? We want to be immortal, absolutely real as persons. That's not possible. Swami Vivekananda said, uh, this individuality, he would make fun. You're not individuals yet. Think about it. Which individual? The baby, the child, the young man or woman, the old person, the one in, in coma in the ICU. Huh? Um, <laughs> Which individual are you? These are just like a work in process, a series of changes. Which is your reality? Is it only when we are identified with the absolute, are we truly individual then? It's the cosmic individual. I don't want to go there because that also God of Father will dismiss. <laughs> cosmic individual is the Virat or the Hiranyagarbha. That's also an uh, appearance. All right. Now, uh, let me do. Just two more. Okay, let me do these. 71, 72, 73. 71. Nakash jayate jiva sambhavo asya na vidyate etad taduttamam satyam yatra kinchin na jayate. So the grand conclusion is really speaking, no creature which has birth, whichever has birth, there is no source for it. And no creature is truly born. This is the highest truth where nothing whatsoever is born. Na kaschit jayate jiva. Ultimately, though they appear to be, they are not truly born. Why? To be born, to be created, to be produced, you require a source, a cause. There is no cause for that. Turiya is the only reality and it can never be a cause. It is consciousness. It is unchanging. It cannot change into that which is not consciousness. So these are all appearances in Turiya. You might as well say the mind of the Swami became a human being, became uh, the landmass of Africa, became the uh, lion. No. Those were all appearances. The mind continued to be mind. Similarly, both the world and the mind are appearances in Turiya, which continues to be Turiya. Sambhava asya na vid, uh, uh, vidyati. Sambhava means cause. There is no cause, no possible cause of the birth of creatures. Notice this is the exact last verse of third chapter. Advaita prakaranam. If you see the last verse, I think 48 verse. You see this verse itself. So, um, so Gaudapada keeps picking out those things and quoting them again and again. Okay. Um, uttamam satyam. Uttamam satyam. Highest truth, Paramarthikam Satyam, Absolute Truth. Um, 72. So the Absolute Truth is that there is Turiya only, non-dual Turiya. 
then what is all this all that we are seeing 72 chitta spandita me vedam grahya grahya kavadvayam chittam nirvishayam nityam asangam te na kirtitam beautiful verse this duality possessed of subject and object is a mere vibration of consciousness and consciousness is objectless hence it is declared to be eternally without relations very powerful verse so let's break it up. 72. Chittam spanditam evedam. We have seen this earlier, the language of vibration, spanda. It's as if it's a vibration of consciousness. What appears? Mind, thought, perceptions and world. All of these are like appearances in consciousness. Just like, good example is dream. Mind being mind, not at all changing from mind, appeared to pro project human beings and animals and space and time and events, all of that. And that's something we cannot deny. We experience in dreams all the time. And nowadays we have virtual reality, which we experience. Very realistic environments, 3D with sound and motion, all of that we can experience. Uh, it can be generated. We just have to give the right impulses to the senses. Uh, and the mind will do the rest, make a world out of it. Um, then next part he says grahya grahya ka vadvayam how does it vibrate how does consciousness vibrate remember caution from advaita perspective really no vibration it's because of maya it seems to be a vibration otherwise uh, you will create trouble for advaita if consciousness starts vibrating it will become sh kashmiri shaivism um, how does it vibrate so called vibration as subject object grahya grahaka as seer and the seen um, hearer and the uh, heard, uh, smeller and the smell, tasted and tasted, uh, as thinker and thought. Uh, so, but chittam nirvishayam nityam, because conscious, all these are projections of consciousness, at no time are they anything apart from consciousness. Think about the dream, when the Swami, dynamic action is going on. The sweating poor Swami is running across the plains of Africa chased by a lion. So much activity is going on. Huh? Time, space, event, um, living beings, uh, predator and prey and all of that. At no point is it anything other than thought. Isn't it? It's the, it's the dreamer's mind. At no point. There are no spaces, time, uh, events, people, animals, nothing. It's a dream. Exactly like that he is saying. Chittam nirvishayam nityam. There is really no object, really no object of consciousness. There are appearances of objects, but no actual object, the way we think it right now. There is a world out there, here I am, and consciousness is experiencing a world apart from it. Real objects, real subject experiencing. No. Chittam nirvishayam. Without consciousness, uh, with consciousness without object. When? Or in Samadhi, when you get Brahma Jnana. No, Nityam. In waking state, in dream state, in deep sleep state. None of them present any object for consciousness really. It's a stunning thing to think of. If you have no object, then what is not possible? No relationship is possible. No subject-object relationship is possible. Why? Because there are no objects. So he says... Asangam te nakirtitam. Therefore, it is sung in the Upanishads. This Purushad consciousness is asanga without any attachment, non stick consciousness. Why? Because there is nothing for it to stick to. There is nothing for it. Relationship requires at least two poles, two terms. Dvinishtha sambandha. Two real terms. Think about it. Can the clay have a relationship with the pot? Clay pot. It's made of clay. Does the clay have a relationship with the pot? No. Because there is no pot apart from the clay itself. Can the water in the wave, the water, have a relationship with the wave? No. So, consciousness has no relationship with what it experiences because they are all no second item or uh, entity apart from the experiencing consciousness and therefore consciousness is asango asangoyam purushaha upanishad says that this is 
ever unattached, even in the midst of thousand relationships, ten thousand attachments, friend, enemy, boss, employee, father, son, daughter, husband, wife, uh, grandfather, grand, uh, you know, grandchildren, uh, my eternal enemy. <laughs> I will never forgive that person. There is not one real relationship here. You are eternally unattached to anything. Proof, notice, none of it continues. None of these so-called relationships ever continues. They all have beginning and end. And even when they have, when they seem to exist, at that time also they don't exist. That's why you have no connection with anything here. Every relationship, and you forget Turiya also, every relationship, it disappears in deep sleep. Every relationship disappears in deep sleep. Why deep sleep? It disappears in dreams. There are other relationships. And in the waking state also, now if you consider even the deepest relationship, how much do you think about it? Do you think about it every moment of every hour of every day? No. To keep a relationship alive, it requires the mind. And to keep the mind alive, it requires consciousness. The consciousness itself is unattached. Asanga. Very important. Notice this. Now, what is the take home from this? You are already at home. So, <laughs> what, is the, uh, uh, what is the spiritual message from this? One very powerful message. While conducting, while in the midst of all of these experiences and relationships, know that you are, by your very definition, by your very existence, ever free from everything. Never feel tied down, burdened. You don't have to run away to the mountain top in Himalayas to be free of uh, relationship, to be free of bondage. Nothing ever can bind you down. Asanga Purusha means nothing can bind this consciousness down. Nothing ever has actually. There is no other thing. What will bind you down? <laughs> Just think about it. It's a stunning thing. It means that you are ever free. You were free. You are free. You will always be free. There is even nothing that you have to do about it. Except realize it. Alright. Then number 73. I'll end with that. We will take a couple of questions. I am going to this because there is an important point being mentioned here. Because uh, Praveer Babu asked about this, uh, some amount of reality to be given to this world. 73. So here Gaurapada climbs down from his high horse and makes some allowance for us poor people. 73. Yo asti kalpita samvritya paramarthena nastya so paratantra bhi samvritya Syanasti paramarthata That which exists because of a fancied empirical outlook does not do so from the standpoint of absolute reality. Anything that may exist on the strength of that empirical outlook engendered by other systems of thought does not really exist. So what does he mean here? So he says all that you are experiencing has a certain transactional reality, Vyavaharika. He calls it Samvritti Satyam. This is Nagarjuna's term. Nagarjuna said the Buddha gave two kinds of teaching, Samvritti and Paramarthika. So, according to Nagarjuna, the Eightfold Way, the Four Noble Truths, Buddha himself, Eightfold Way, Nirvana, all of that, Samsara, all of that is Samvritti Satya, the apparent truth. Samvritti literally means covering. Sanskrit Samvritti means covering, that which covers up. This Samritti term was abandoned later and it became in Advaita Vedanta became Vyavaharika, transactional, empirical. So there is a certain empirical value to it. This is important to notice. Because after a strong dose of Gaudapada, people go around demolishing everybody else's, um, you know, it's all false, it, it, it does not matter, it's a dream, uh, don't care. And then you get into clash with other people who don't understand. They have not gone through Mandukya for two years. <laughs> they are normal people. We have become abnormal. So they are normal people. They will, uh, they will say, what do you mean the world is false? It's absolutely true. It's true. You are seeing it, hearing it. And they will say things like, go without food one day. You will realize the world is true or not. Yeah. 
and you will answer Gaudapada has very nice answers to all of that knower and know, known they depend upon each other rise and fall food and eater of the food yeah. so if food is not there the eater will be hungry food is there eater will be satisfied but does not mean neither food or not the eater is real people will think this man has gone crazy stop going to zoom classes <laughs> so brainwashed so Gaudapada here says no there is a field of transactional reality Samritti Satyam or Vyavaharika Satyam, whatever you call it. In the dream, you better behave as if the lion is real, as you were behaving, and run away from the lion if you are going to save yourself, and pray to God also. Knowing all the while, he says, Nasti Aso, it is not true, Paramarthika Drishtya. What is the language he used? Pa, uh, Paramarthena Nasti Aso. From Turiya perspective, my, in reality, internally you know, n all of this is an appearance. If, so use your common sense in the midst of appearance. If you feel thirsty in the dream, go to the dream lake and drink the dream water knowing all the time it is dream. In the waking state, after this, please go and have your dinner as I will, after reading that the dinner is false and the eater is false. But there is a transactional reality in which it has a, has a value. See, you will spoil the whole thing if in the in the movie, from the beginning to end, a Harry Potter movie, if you have taken your children to watch it and you tell the children from beginning to end, there is no Harry Potter, there is no magic, there is no movie, beginning to end, if you keep on telling that, then the movie is spoiled. Within the movie, there is a plot. There is a hero, there is a villain, there is activities, something happens. Give, so, you must retain the ability to act within the movie, knowing all the time it is a movie. You see, otherwise, what is the use of Advaita? Advaita tells you while being fully active, reasonable, discussing, accepting everything what people are saying as real also, knowing that there is a deeper reality, Paramartha Satyam, where all of this is an appearance. All of Gaudapada uh, applies, it is true, but I can function just like everybody else in this world and better than everybody else. Why? Everybody else take this world to be the reality and the only reality. Therefore, terror and temptation and fear and anxiety. Yeah, you know all of these are appearances in, in you, the Thurium. Neither the COVID, nor the body affected by COVID, nor the person, uh, say I am lying down in ICU and coma and dying. No problem. From Thuria perspective, all of it is an appearance. If the person, uh, this uh, body dies and falls also, as it will one day. It is of no consequence at all to the real you. You are totally free of it. You never wear this body. Why are you so concerned about this body? You are completely free, completely safe, all the time, uh -huh. without any effort. So, this is what the, the grand conclusion that Gaudapada tells us. But within the Vyavaharika, please behave. You can behave. You are free to behave. Do not be this crazy Mandukya Gaudapada person spoiling everybody's dinner and uh, saying crazy things. So, then he says, what about the other philosophers? So, he is making a philosophical point. Paratantra abhisamritya syat. Paratantra, other philosophies. Other philosophies are also vyavaharika. So, when the, I can accept and understand when the Sankhya says, consciousness is real, but the world is also real, two realities, consciousness and world, Prakriti Purusha. I say, I put, put certain restrictions, limitations, parameters on the Advaitic perspective, you will get Sankhya. Put further restrictions, you will get something like Nyaya. Yeah. I say, no, Jiva Jagat Ishwara is real. Dvaita Vedanta will tell you. The Advaitin is perfectly comfortable with that. Only thing he says, he does not have to go and say there is all false. No. Upon a deeper investigation, you find a deeper reality called Turiya. But, if you do not want to go there, Dvaitavadi does not accept Nirguna Brahman, does not accept Turiya as we have talked about. Vishishta Dvaitavadi does not accept. They all stop, all theistic religions stop with um, Jiva Jagat Ishwara. There is God, there is the world and there is you. Now let us talk. All right. The Advaitin can happily function with that. The, the test of a deeper philosophy of a truer philosophy is that it can easily understand the more um, less the less advanced the more primitive philosophies 
more primitive or less advanced philosophies cannot ad understand the deeper philosophy. See, from um, you as a PhD in mathematics or physics, you can understand what the little kid is studying in um, grade 5 or grade 6 science. You understand very well, but that kid does not understand you. That does not mean that you will have to say that everything is wrong in your textbook, not at all. Under a certain perspective, it is right and the kid has to learn that way. So, when you talk with the kid and you teach physics and mathematics to the kid at grade 5 or grade 6 level, you behave accordingly. You do not look at it from the perspective of uh, relativistic physics or from super string theory, no. Okay. Samvritya. Um, without compromising your Advaitic uh, foundation, you can happily interact with. So, many people are misled by this. You know, when I say, I am so happy to learn Kashmiri Shaivism, Madhyamaka Buddhism, Shunyavada, Vijnanavada, many different theories of um, uh, Western philosophy and all. I can understand and I can appreciate it, even use it. But that people are misled. Not that I agree with it, not at all. <laughs> not at all. It is only at a certain level. If you really want to investigate it, the whole thing will fall apart. A apply something like um, say Gaudapada's analysis, it just disappears. None of those philosophies, as he says, um, Abhisamritya, Paratantra, they are all part of Samritti Satyam, uh, transactional reality. They have their use. I am not saying they do not have their use. Okay. If mind is, for example, I will end with this, mind is disturbing me, then what will help me? Patanjali yoga will help you, certainly. Mindfulness meditation will help you. See, Godapada will say you have taken the mind as real, you have taken the disturbances as real and you have set up a project for removing disturbances, real disturbances from a real mind. Alright, then go to Patanj Patanjali yoga or uh, mindfulness meditation and they will help at that particular stage. But one thing you will notice is, there is no final satisfaction in any of those systems. Final liberating satisfaction comes from this and this alone. So, I am sharing with you my agreement with Gaudapada. Okay. Last observations, comments before we end? Amiji, there are two questions in chat. Yes. Um, Rodrigo and Peter. Yes. So, Rodrigo says, moment of realization in that instant, are the Indriyas shut down or working to their full potential? In the moment of realization, if it you are talking about Samadhi, Patanjali Yoga and all. Yeah. At that time, everything has to be shut down. You have to be sitting still, Ashtanga Yoga, uh, Sampragyata and Asampragyata Samadhi. You have to be sitting still, even the breath is uh, in Kumbhaka and uh, sense, sense organs are uh, not outward, mind is shut down. So, that is yogic. Um, in uh, Advaitic realization, all of it could be working. Practical purposes, you have to focus for a while on Advaitic teaching. At that time, you cannot have mind thinking of all things, eyes and ears seeing different things and the mind scattered, that will not work. Some amount of focus is necessary. Then, that sounds like Thakur's Vigyan a very big topic. No, it, Thakur's Vigyan is actually a little deeper than this. Notice, <laughs> Gaudapada has a slightly snarky attitude. He will keep saying that, they are all transactional reality, they are all Vyavaharika, Samvritti Satyam. Yeah. So, fine, like investigate deeper, I agree with you at that level, investigate deeper, all of this disappears. But Thakur does not do that. All right. Uh, Peter Fell, Swamiji, if the reality is eternal and unattached, 4.72 is Gaudapada and attached, there is something that is permanent and unattached. Is this a break with the Manduk, Madhyamaka position of no position? Ah. You have to wait for 4.72. Uh, where he will say, whatever I have taught you till now about Turiya, now it is the time to let it go. Pure being Sat, no. All pervading reality, Sarvabhyapi Brahman, no. Eternal reality, no. 
all of that is going to come. V very shocking, but very logical as if you think about it. He will use the Madhyamaka approach, the Shunyavada approach. I'm saying that, for example, um, the Turiya is beyond cause and effect, which means causality is an appearance. There is no real causality. Now he will ask in number 74, if there is no real causality, what is the point of talking about beyond cause and effect? It is not there. So why talk about it being there? Once you have understood, once you have removed the error of causality, now will you say, define Turiya as being that which is beyond causality, but now all that problem of causality is over, suppose, you have gone through all this. Now why use that definition? Let go of it. If you say, um, all pervading Brahman, but you are accepting all, then only you are saying all pervading Brahman. Uh, that you are accepting space, saying all pervading Brahman. Eternal reality. You are accepting time and then you are saying eternal reality. Uh, you are a non-dual, even Advaita. There is no second thing. You are accepting that there could be other things. Then with respect to that you are saying they are not different from Brahman. So they are, uh, Brahman is non-dual. But others are not there at all. Where is the duality which you are, you are uh, distinguishing Brahman from? Uh, so he will go into that level of analysis which is very Madhyamaka. Uh, but I will, let me not um, talk about it now. That is why I kept it for tomorrow. It's, uh, you have to approach it with a fresh mind. It can be very shocking. But then you will see it is very logical also. It is just the logical next step to take. take. Yeah, I think at that point, Sushma ji, hold on to your question. Sushma Burdliya, hold on to a question. We'll have it. Uh, we'll deal with it tomorrow. We have well gone well over time.